1967, 20th Century Fox took a gamble and released a film so lurid and so sensational, it was bound to put the way Hollywood made movies on its ear. And that film was Valley of the Dolls. Based on Jacqueline Suzanne's best-selling novel, the film starred Barbara Perkins, better known in TV's Peyton Place, Sharon Tate, best known as director Roman Polanski's wife and future victim to mass murderer Charlie Manson, and TV's Patty Duke, who wanted to shed her squeaky clean all-American image with a meaty, dirty role. But was Valley of the Dolls a safe bet for Richard Zanuck? Let's find out. So we begin, like all Hollywood stories begin, with someone leaving their small town for life in the big city. In this story, that person is Ann Wells, who moves to New York and gets a job as an assistant to a New York theatrical agency. Her first assignment is to have star Helen Lawson sign some contracts. There, she gets her first taste of show business and the undeniable talent of Neely O'Hara. That, that girl who was singing out there, she's very good, isn't she? Yeah. Hey, how do you think the kid's song works in a new spot? Great, huh? The song goes. Okay, I know that you're new to this and all, but even I know that the only person that you compliment in Hollywood or on Broadway is the person that you're talking to. In the chorus line is Jennifer North, who really makes a statement with um, her, um... 600 bucks for a headdress and not a soul will see it. I feel a little top-heavy. Oh, honey, you are a little top-heavy. <laughs> you would think that this film would be packed with jokes like these. But, nope, not really. It's the only one. Sorry. So Helen Lawson has her agency try to convince Neely to leave the show for contractual reasons, but the agency sees that Neely has talent and books her really fast on a telethon. It's impossible to tell you right now. If I tried it, I'd never know how. Gee, luck ain't for me. Far as I know, far as I see, I'm no winner, boy. I'd make a mess, baby, unless you say so. Huh. I didn't think there was such a market for singers with epilepsy. Could be possible, how would I know? So I'll try it and give it a go. Hey, was that intentional? No, that, that was intentional. That, that can't be intentional. So in celebration for Neely's um, successful performance, the gang all goes out to a nightclub. Jennifer happens to be there as well and happens to fall in love at first sight with the lounge singer, Tony, and Tony vice versa, all to the chagrin of his sister slash manager. Friend of yours? I don't know. I never saw her before, but I'm going to see her again. Tony, how many times do I have to tell you? At night, all cats are gray. <sighs> I have no response to that. Later that night, Neely tells her boyfriend Mel the feeling that she got with the audience's positive response to her performance. I felt like they were all taking me in their arms and holding me. It's like when you put your hands on me. Only it was double, triple. So he puts his hands on your shoulders and you get all wet. God, I wish I could find a girl like that. Meanwhile, Burke tries to woo Anne. Do you realize, Miss Wells, that you are the most beautiful girl that ever left her lipstick in my office? You like women, don't you? So Neely makes it big and goes to Hollywood to be in the movies and to begin her dependencies on the dolls, better known as drugs, also known as uppers and downers. Meanwhile, Jennifer and Tony continue their affair. Let's go up to your apartment. We'll take the phone off the hook this time so Miriam can't bother us. How's that? Come on. Uh. 
My mother says I should have held out and made you marry me. <laughs> oh, baby. When did I ever do anything my mother told me to? There you go. Keep the sexual revolution alive and kicking. Dr. Eberhardt. Oh, this is Miriam Polar. Yes, I called you because I'm worried. Tony just got married. Anne gets offered a modeling career for a line of makeup and gets whisked away to, of all places, Hollywood. Just in time to see Neely receive a special award, a Grammy. Oh, it's not that special. Everyone has a Grammy, even Homer Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Jessel. I'd like to thank all of you here and all of you out there who made this possible. By the way, don't forget to see my new film, Love and Let Love, opening at the Music Hall this week. <laughs> I sing some great new songs in it. Oh, okay. great. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, uh, it was a promotional Grammy. However, trouble is brewing in the household of Tony and Jennifer. I might as well give it to you all at once. The studio dropped my option. So what? There are lots of other studios. I never have let them put you in westerns. You're a romantic lead. Sure, sure. Look! You're a singer. You can always go back to nightclubs. I don't want to go back to nightclubs. Don't worry about it. Will you do me a favor? You just not worry about it. He doesn't want to go back to nightclubs. He wants to make pictures. I'm going to heat up the lasagna. Now, I didn't do any type of tricky editing just to make a joke. That's how the scene meant. It's as if the writers just couldn't think of anything else to progress the scene along. So they just said, I'm going to heat up the lasagna and then move on. Just move on. Move on. Don't worry. Move on. Heat up the lasagna. Move on. Then to make matters worse, Tony falls ill. Literally. Then Jennifer has more bad news. I'm pregnant. So, to pay the bills, Jennifer meets a French film producer to make... I make the art film. Yes, I've seen a few. They're pretty raw. I mean, French subtitles over a bare bottom doesn't necessarily make it art. Meanwhile, the effects of drugs and alcohol begin to take a toll on Neely's work habits. She also catches her husband with another woman. All right, faggot. Start explaining. It has gotten to a point that Neely is told that she would have to go to rehab. Or in 60s speak, I want you to go to a sanitarium. Isn't a sanitarium a little too extreme? I mean, all it is is a dependency on drugs and alcohol. I mean, yeah, it's gotten a little bit too much for Neely, but still a... Yeah, sanitarium. But instead of a sanitarium, Neely goes to San Francisco. Boobies, boobies, boobies. Nothing but boobies. Really? San Francisco? Hm. Jennifer returns to the U.S. only to find out that she has breast cancer and has to get a mastectomy. All I know how to do is take off my clothes. So she kills herself. Of course! Neely, just out of rehab, goes for a comeback on the New York stage with Burke escorting her. The papers find out that they are having an affair. While in New York, Neely decides to crash a party for Helen Lawson and confronts her in the bathroom. Who are you hiding from, Helen? The notices couldn't have been that bad. Oh, you gonna take that? The show just needs a little doctoring. Don't worry, sweetheart. If it flops, I can always get you a job as understudy for my grandmother. Thanks. I've already turned down the part you're playing. Oh, ho, ho, no, you didn't. Bull. Merrick's not that crazy. You should know, honey. You just came out of the nut house. Oh, snap. You take that back. You get your hand off me. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, she's old. Fed up with the lying, backstabbing, drugs, and fame itself, Anne goes back home never to return to the crazy Hollywood life. And that was Valley of the Dolls. This was a prime example of the studio picture trying to be gritty and hard-hitting and failing miserably. Its portrayal of 
drug and alcohol dependency while trying to be realistic only becomes comical with the end result. The performances are mostly weak, the songs are totally second rate with the exception of the beautiful title song sung by Dionne Warwick, and the realistic glitz and glamour of Hollywood looks just like a studio created it. However, I totally loved Patty Duke in this film. Yes, it was over the top and hokey, but man, what a performance. She was overacting to the extreme in this film, but it fit. Compared to her, Barbara Perkins and Sharon Tate's performance looked like store mannequins. Patty Duke had a fire and intensity that could move mountains in this film. Oh, Neely. Neely a little bit of trivia for you. While this film states in the beginning that this was a work of fiction, the characters were sort of based on real people at the time. Jennifer North was based on Marilyn Monroe. Neely O'Hara was based on a combination of Judy Garland and Betty Hutton. Tony Pollard was based on a combination of Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. Helen Lawson was based on Ethel Merman. And of course, Anne Wells was based on the author herself, Jacqueline Suzanne. And knowing that, you can now go beyond the Valley of the Dolls. I'm Zach Scott, and I'm going to heat up the lasagna. It's impossible, it's not my style. If I tried it, I'd miss by a mile. I'm not worth a dime. Ain't got the stuff, ain't got the time. I'm a loser, I ain't for success, baby, unless you say so. Mother, I know I don't have any talent, and I know all I have is a body, and I am doing my bust exercises. Oh, to hell with them. Let them droop.